The next 107 days in the United States of America may be the most important, they certainly will be the most important days of your lifetime, at least to this time in your history. 107 days. And the question will be, what will you do during that time? Uh, you'll certainly breathe, you'll live your life, you'll do those kinds of things, but will you live in such a way that it makes a difference in the destiny of a people? Because none of us get to pick the day and age in which we live. None of us pick this day to be alive. But the Bible says in the 139th Psalm that there was a God who is intimately acquainted with all of our ways. He knew exactly before you were ever a thought in terms of your parents and procreation and you being brought to live upon the earth. God knew you. And he knew that you would be alive in this day. So it seems to me that uh, in light of that, it begs a great question. The question is, how then should we live in light of the day that we've been called to live in? It also begs another question. How then are we called to live as people who are not only American citizens, but we have a higher citizenship? We have a citizenship. The Bible says our citizenship is in heaven, that we are people of the kingdom of God. We are called to live out the precepts and values of the kingdom of God in the middle of this nation. We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven first, and then we are American citizens. And if we will if we live out those virtues and values of the kingdom of God, then we will stand, we will live for, we will stand for, we will speak for those virtues and values that have made this nation the greatest nation that has ever existed on the face of the earth. One hundred and seven days. I am... Uh, as I said to you when I did the series on racism, we are surrounded by problems. We know that. We have a pandemic we're dealing with. Um, so we understand that. We have everything that, is, that has come from, uh, that erupted from the time the police officer put his knee on George. George Floyd's neck, and we have all of the issues that uh, that, that that incident released. The issues were there. And so we have all of that. We have the economic crisis that is a result of the actions taken in the pandemic. We have a fourth crisis. We have a crisis of confidence because we're not quite sure who to believe when everything is said and done. We don't know what to believe. Um, we have experts that told us one thing and then they tell us another. We have one expert who said that when it comes to the subject of wearing masks, who told us all not to wear masks, and then now it's wearing a mask will solve everything I'm not even arguing whether you should or shouldn't wear a mask. But when that, when that person who is, at this point, seemingly the most respected person in America by the polls, well, said, well, the reason I told you that at the beginning was because there weren't enough masks to go around and I wanted to make sure the medical people could have the mask. Well, wouldn't that be called a lie? So we have a crisis of confidence. We're not quite sure who to believe. 
So how then, in what will be, at least to this point in your life, the most important election that has ever happened? Because in 107 days, you will decide the future of this nation. As I said to you when I spoke the series on racism, I am not talking to you as people of a world system. I'm talking to you as kingdom people, unashamedly Christian, biblical, Christocentric. We are making no apology for the fact that we stand upon the word of God and that uh, our opinions, our convictions come from what we believe the word says to us in the middle of this hour. We are not people who take the word of God and shape it into our philosophy. As people of the kingdom, we are called to serve a king in a way that we receive his mandate. To to, as Jesus said when he taught the disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This election is really not about two men. You are a very shallow thinker if you think that this election is about Donald Trump and Joe Biden if you think it is about one of two personalities, if you think it is about who you like or you dislike, those would be very poor reasons to vote for anyone. There is much, much more at stake. Your family is at stake. Your future is at stake. The future of this nation is at stake. This election is about two ideologies. And one of them will prevail. At least in my lifetime, I have never seen an election that the two, the two sides were so clearly, uh, so clearly saying what they stood for. And all of us are standing between those two voices, and we will decide. Which ideology do we want to live under? Because in America, Donald Trump is not king, and neither will Joe Biden be. In America, you're the king. That's how this great nation was founded. Every person serving in a political office is put in that office to serve you. They are not there for you to serve them. I know the system has been convoluted. I know that there are politicians who think they're the Messiah. But the reality is they are servants. It is how this nation has functioned, and it is the only way this nation will continue to function. If those who make the decisions, the lawmakers, are subject to the will of the people who put them into office. So as a kingdom person, you do not have the privilege of opting out. You don't get that right. As a Christian, you don't have that right. You have a role in light of this nation to function as a, as, a, as a believer in Jesus Christ, and in so doing, your responsibility to the rest of everyone in this nation is to make sure that you stand up for what is righteous in the Scripture. The anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-everything of moral order has been making gains for more than 50 years. And what the church has done is there's a segment of the church that has bemoaned what has been lost. 
And the rest of the church has been oblivious, being about whatever their agendas happen to be. And we've moaned and groaned, but not done anything about it. And we kept electing people to office and presidents who appointed judges who systematically stripped away the fundamental values of this nation. We've seen those fundamental values that have made us great stripped away. Our founders would not even recognize the godless nation we have become. Not just secular, but anti-everything God and of his moral way, including human sexuality, gender identity, marriage, killing of the innocent babies, no prayer in schools, uh, no Bible. Though in the early days of this great republic, if you lived in that day, your children, the primer, the primer that was used to teach them how to read was the scripture. No Ten Commandments. The embracing of, of lifestyles that the, the Bible specifically says are wrong, homosexuality. Uh, when a person feels like they know better than God, they can decide. And all of that is called right and moral and good. The Bible says it is not right and not moral and not good. So we come to 2016, and a very unlikely person was elected to be president. He was not my choice to be president of the United States. I still don't like a lot of stuff he does. A very unlikely man. But someone God has used in the last three and a half years to push back against the erosion of everything good and godly. Someone who I would have preferred it would have been a very godly man. He spoke at Liberty University and he used a verse and he was mocked because he used it and it wasn't, he didn't get it. One of the National ministry, national ministry leaders who's a friend of mine after that said to me, we were talking one day, and he said, uh, I'm the one who gave him that verse. I said, you are? He said, yeah. I went over with him like six or seven times. I'm, I'm pretty positive he understood it, but obviously he didn't get it. See, uh, one thing that's really good to learn, I realize there's no amens in this message, and hopefully there will be some by the end. But uh, one of the things that's good to learn is that God picks people you wouldn't pick. And he uses people that you wouldn't use. In fact, that's how some of you actually got to where you are. Is that nobody else would pick you, but God picked you. The truth is, the reason I'm standing here in front of you today is nobody would have picked me. Nobody. I wouldn't have picked myself. My parents... My parents would, if you'd have said to them, do you think he'll ever, and you listed all the stuff that God's allowed us to do, Becky and me to do all the years, my parents would have said, no, 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 he, he, he'll, he'll, he'll never, he'll never amount to that. As a matter of fact, one of our, one of the people over us in spiritual authority one time, after we first got married, we went to stay at their house. We didn't have any money. They took us in. And before we left the next morning, the guy's wife said to Becky, I have no idea what you saw in him. You could have done a whole lot better than him. <laughs> That's how we started out. God picks people you wouldn't pick. So God picked a man who has led, who has inspired people and led people to stand up. And the last three and a half years, we've seen a pushback against the moral rot that's, that, has, that is causing the implosion of our nation. Um... If I, if I have my numbers right, now there are more conservative federal court of appeals than there are liberal. That did not exist three and a half years ago. 
And you can't determine what a, every judge will do once they get into office, uh, and you shouldn't be able to do that. They, but you should know where they stand and all of those kinds of things. And now, if I recall, uh, President Trump has now filled 200 vacancies of judges that to the best of their ability, in terms of those who vetted them and all of that, will turn the country back to what our founding values have been. There's a group of people who hate that. And that's what you're seeing today. And it's more than just people. Because there is a spirit behind all of this. Remember, I'm talking to you as the people of God today. I'm not talking to you as just some secular person out there on the street who thinks this is all political. The battle lines have been drawn. And this election is going to determine uh, it's going to determine who or what we will be as a nation. One leader of the present anarchy that we have seen this nation involved in, the violence, the destruction by the thugs, I'm not talking about people who marched uh, to demonstrate for a cause. I'm talking about uh, there's a line. And when those people started destroying, when people started destroying other people's property, taking away their rights, they are nothing but thugs. And it's what they should be called. I don't care what color they are, doesn't make any difference. Um, and one leader of the anarchy and violence and destruction in the cities across the nation, here's what he said, quote, if the U.S. doesn't give us what we want, then we will burn down this system. So I'm just saying to all of you, you better wake up. Because you're part of the system. You can't just stand on the sideline anymore and look in and go, well, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not involved. You're going to be involved. Just like that couple who stood out in front of their home. You saw the pictures with, all, with their guns. The people that were there broke a gate down to get there. That used to be called a crime. Somebody broke your gate down? Uh, they were trespassing. The police should be there. Should have arrested them. You shouldn't have to stand out front of your house with weapons. With people yelling things to you like, I'm going to be, I I'm taking your bedroom. Uh, that's a part of your house I'm living in. And yet it's called a peaceful protest. 107 days, you better wake up. Or it's going to be too late. There are a lot of giants. They're shouting today. Around us. Voices. Intimidating. Causing fear. If you don't go along with the narrative, you're shamed. Even some of our good politicians uh, to get people to conform are using the tactics of shame. I'm just going to tell you, I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat, that is a terrible way to lead. You do not lead by shaming people. You lead by causing people to rise up and stand up and be their best. You bring out the best in people. You don't shame them. So what we want is a champion. We want a savior. We, uh, the silent majority, and it is that. The majority of Americans of every color do not want to burn our cities down. The majority of Americans of every color do not believe that they should be able to come in and take whatever you have, or you should be able to come and take whatever they have. The majority of Americans still back the law enforcement community 
Not, they don't back rogue officers, but they still back the law enforcement community because they recognize that in, if, if you do not have laws and enforceable laws, then you have anarchy. You don't get to have it both ways. We want someone, we would rather someone go for us, fight for us, do it for us. Because of a number of reasons. With that, let me take you to the scripture. I'm going to read one of the best known stories in the Bible. Now it's going to take a few minutes. I'm going to take the time. You have nowhere to go today. Uh, anyway, and we'll get out before the next service starts. And the reason for that is that, that whatever time we get out, that's when the next service will start. So, 1 Samuel chapter 17. I'm going to start reading in verse 2. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped at the valley of Elah, drew up in a battle array against the Philistines. Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Let me just tell you that right now, today, this day, the, you, when I read this, this uh, lesson in the scripture, you need to get a mental picture of where we are in this nation. This is exactly where we are today. Forces are aligned. And a champion went out from the camp of, of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span, nine feet, nine inches tall. Nine feet, nine inches tall. So get the biggest basketball player there is and, get, and, and add a foot and a half to him. And here's a guy coming out. It'd be pretty intimidating. He had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, 126 pounds. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels and a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the armies of Israel. Notice this. I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And then look down at verse 20. So David rose early in the morning, left the sheep with the keeper, took the things, and went as Jesse had commanded him. His father had sent him to take supplies to his brothers who were in the army. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to fight and shouting for the battle. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up in battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in the hand of the supply keeper, ran to the army, and came and greeted his brothers. Then as he talked with them, there was the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke according to the same words. So David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel, and it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, We'll give him his daughter, give his father's house exemption from taxes. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach? Notice this. And takes away the reproach from Israel. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. See the shaming that's going on right there? Who, who do you think you are? And David answered, what have, you, what have I done now? 
Is there not a cause? Verse 30. Then he turned from him toward another and said the same thing, and these people answered him as the first ones did. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he said to him, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail. Because of him your servant will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth, and when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion, from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor, put, put a bronze helmet on his head, clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk. Notice this, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. The church, in the middle of this day, better recognize that God has given us tested weapons in the middle of this battle that we better use. We cannot fight with the weapons of the world system that's around us. Then he took his staff in his hand. He chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, put them in a shepherd's bag in a pouch, which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog? that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. You're hearing a lot of that right now. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all, listen, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag, took out a stone. He slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him, but there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword, and drew it out of its sheath and killed him, and cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. Now, let me make a statement that everyone should hear. Clearly, Donald Trump is not David. Donald Trump is not our David. In the, in the scenario of this word, you are David. You are David. Donald Trump is not our savior. The salvation of this nation will rest with the electorate alone. Whom we choose to represent us. 
And in that, you have a voice. It may remain silent, or you may speak up. But you have a voice, because you have a vote. Let me take you into the lesson and just make a few observations today that it seems to me parallel the situation that we find ourselves in in the middle of this time. Notice that uh, Jesse's dad sends David to take some supplies, but David do doesn't just take the supplies, drop them off, turn around, and head back. He goes to see the battle. He intentionally goes to see the battle. See, if you, if you don't, if you, if you aren't awake enough where you have seen the battle today, then all you have to go on is what you hear. Who you're listening to. Now the battle that's in front of us today isn't hard to see. It's all around us. You, you have to be totally asleep at the switch if you don't recognize the conflict, the chaos that exists today in the middle of this hour. If you go on only what you hear from someone else, what you hear might be wrong. We certainly know in the middle of all of the crises that we are facing right now that there have been a whole lot of people wrong. We have been told a whole lot of things that have turned out not to be true. And, I, and you, you can mark this down, and if I'm not right on this, I will gladly proclaim that I am a false prophet. But when all this is over and we're looking back, I'm going to tell you there's a whole lot more stuff that hasn't come out yet that's wrong. There's a whole lot of stuff we're being fed a bill of goods on by people who have an agenda. You see, what you hear might not give you the whole picture of what's at stake. Those who are reinventing our history. If you only listen to them and you don't go do some research yourself to see what the founders wrote because original documents exist. You don't have to believe anybody. Go read what the founders wrote. You want to know what they thought? Make your own judgment. Or you can listen to all these voices that are out there today that are reinventing everything, including history. And incidentally, they are teaching that to your children in the schools you're sending them to. Brainwashing them. Setting them up for a day when this nation will be turned over to some socialistic order. We are so far down the path of being turned over, losing our freedoms, that if we do not wake up, this may be what pushes us over. When you actually see the battle and you hear the enemy shouting, you get close enough. You're just not watching the news at night. You see the battle. You hear the threats and the taunts. It causes you to make a choice. See, if you get close enough to the battle, now, now you are there. Now you recognize that the battle is real. Now you're going to have to make a choice. You either engage in the battle or you run away. Because you got close enough. You can see that What's out there is real. You make a choice. In the middle of all the tumult and the shouting and the champion that is threatening 
You have to decide in the middle of that if you will stand up and speak out and shout back. Or you will live under intimidation and fear. Remember, I'm only just talking to Christian people here. People who say they believe in God. Who say they still believe in miracles. Still believe that he is the God of all power. He's the God of the book. And see, in the middle of this hour, more than likely, the average everyday Joe or Mary, the average American citizen, because this has been the pattern for the last more than 50 years. It's why we're where we are. Of a people who've had things gradually stripped away and they just bemoaned it, but they never stood up. They never said, we're done, we're fed up, we're not having any more of this. Probably in the middle of this hour, unless you're convinced of the size of your God, before you ever get to the battle, you'll turn around and run away. That's why, you see, there's plenty of born-again, what they say, they say they are Bible-believing Christians in this nation to turn this nation around in one day. If every Bible-believing, born-again Christian who says they believe in the precepts of the kingdom of God would show up and vote and would vote biblically, the nation would be turned around in one election. But the truth is, the majority of Bible-believing, born-again Christians don't show up for the battle. They turn around away. Why? Or maybe they never got close enough to even see what the battle was. Why? So all around us, the nation is imploding. And, and, and Christian believers are just proceeding on their merry way. Too busy, too intimidated, too, uh, too appeasement-oriented. Because see, look, if you view the battle before us right now through, just through the lens of human possibility, things don't look good at all. They don't look good. So let me, let me take a couple minutes and uh, Romans 12, there are a number of other passages in the scripture. In Romans 12, one translation says, don't be squeezed into the world's mold. Do you feel the squeezing? You don't answer this except to yourself. You feel intimidated about speaking out? Feel a little afraid to stand up for something that may be controversial? Worried about being shamed if you don't comply? See, when, when the issue of your constitutional rights used to be raised years ago, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Because that document is what's kept this nation free all these years. That document and people willing who every generation who embraced the truths of that document to say, uh, this nation is not perfect. It's never going to be because we, we, we live in an evil world. Evil will always exist until Jesus comes again. And things as they are are no more. And God sets a new order in place. If you're thinking that somehow there's going to be this utopian thing come upon the earth and man is going to get everything all together, you need to know that's not going to happen. There are clear, clear signs right now of the end of all time happening around us, biblical signs. But in the middle of the evil day, in terms of our nation, um, there are some things that have guaranteed your rights, guaranteed your freedoms. How easily in the middle of this crisis time, 
people had been willing to surrender those. Shamed, intimidated. Those should never be surrendered. You should always stand for that. Your, when your freedoms and, and rights are taken away, they are rarely ever, almost never, ever given back. Look, we have ministries in 107 nations of the world. We have ministries in nations where there is huge repression. We have churches in Venezuela. We have ministries in Cuba. We have ministries in places right now, if you go out of your house without the permission of the government, you'll be put into jail. Most of the people of the world live very differently than you do. And the reason is because their rights are not guaranteed like yours are. So there's this squeezing right now. Most pressure I've ever seen in my lifetime. I didn't think things would ever get worse than the Vietnam War, all the protests and stuff that happened during that era. My, in my adult life, I just Vietnam War, I was, uh, I was, I had one of the draft numbers. So that was my entrance into adult life, that era. I didn't think things would ever get worse than that. That'd be, that'd be a patty cake party compared to where we are right now. I don't want to be negative, but uh, it's my opinion that there's a lot of Christian people in the middle of this day that are being shaped by the world's way of thinking rather than their minds being renewed by the word of God. And they are first a kingdom person before they are an American person. So in the middle of the evil day, they're able to stand with clarity of thought. They know what the values and virtues are. They're not owned by a political party. They are standing for what is right and righteous. So uh, it's just easier to let other people shout for us. After all, who will listen to us? We don't have a megaphone. And after all, we're busy. We have other things. You know that, Steve, that whole thing, that's really not my deal. Okay, I get it. So it seems to me, and this is really the heart of the message right here. Uh, so the genesis of, if, if you thought, well, all this talk, well, here, here's the deal. Here's where the, the genesis of this message began in my spirit as I was praying earlier this week. It seems to me that, um, that you have people who make individual decisions, each of us. And then those individual decisions at some point become corporate in terms of a church. What the church is, the local expression of the church of Jesus. We have... Uh, uh, as individuals and as the church in this hour, we have largely bought into appeasement. Now, if you don't hear anything else I've said today, I want you to hear this. We've largely bought into appeasement. Oh, oh, uh, all those who are, all that, well, if we could just appease them, you know, we'll just, we'll just, uh, uh, Oh, okay, so you don't want us to stand for God uh, in the public school, so we'll just, okay, so, so we'll just train our kids at home. So the school teacher 
can talk about every derogatory thing about this nation to your kids, but they cannot mention their testimony of faith in God. Something is desperately wrong with that. Where is the absolute backlash of people who are so fed up with that stuff that they will not be silent? Oh, oh, well, uh, and... Uh, Oh, and we shouldn't have the Ten Commandments in the courthouse, let alone that that's the basis of all moral law. The basis of law in this nation was the Ten Commandments. That is your history. Uh, oh, so we'll just surrender that one. How much are you willing to be appeased before you stand up or... or or will you ever? Now we have governors telling us when we can have church and not have church. In California, the governor of California, King Newsom, who thinks he's the Messiah himself. He is, uh, he is now legislating the liturgy of the church. I had a few conversations with some of our churches out there. It has now come down to an act's decision. Do we obey man or God? God said, let the high praise of God be in our mouths. Shout to God with a voice of triumph. We choose to obey God rather than man. Appeasement never works. Because behind these voices that are shouting out there, the physical voices, all, 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 of the, uh, all of the things that you see, the vitriol and all of that, listen, there is a spirit behind that. You of all people should know that. A demonic spirit. Jesus clearly said there is a destroyer. He said, I've come to give you life. Full of abundance. He, he didn't mean by that he came to give all of you uh, um, luxury cars and the biggest houses in the world. He didn't, he didn't mean it, but he meant a life that's filled with satisfaction and purpose. I don't care what the challenges are. But there's a thief that's come to steal from you. To take. To destroy. To kill you comes to kill. So if the, if, um, if, the thief, if the thief is just in the stealing stage, you need to know. If you think the thief is going to stop at stealing, he's not. The ultimate aim of the spirit is to kill you. It's clear. Jesus said it. So Behind the outward action is a demonic spirit. That spirit is after subjugation, meaning that you, that it dominates you, rules you. It tells you what to do, when to go to bed, when to get up. If you've ever been uh, addicted, you thought you could handle whatever it was, a substance or alcohol or something like that. And then it began controlling you. You had to have it. You had to have it more. Pretty soon, you lived for that. That was Becky's dad's story. He lived to drink. Alcoholic. Ultimately, so it brings you into subjugation and, and, dominion, and, and domination and then destruction. First a robber steals everything. Then a destroyer comes to destroy everything, then a killer comes. The ultimate goal is to eliminate you. Jesus said that. So, appeasement leads you to buy into the narrative of the day, pressed into the world's mold. Um... And if you buy into that, 
you'll be oblivious to what's happening in the world around you. There's a lot of churches right now, business as usual. How in the world in the middle of this crisis? How in the world? Could you still be playing spiritual patty cake in the middle of this? I mean, how much more has to happen for the people of God to wake up and say, what in the world is going on here? You know, sit around, hug each other, get a, a, virtually. I guess you put your fingers on the screen. I, I'm not quite sure how you do all that. You know, we're, gonna, we're so proud of all the views we have. We're, we're so, oh, oh, all this. And we're, we're doing some of this stuff. And so, honest, honest to God, I mean, I don't watch all that because it just ticks me off. But honestly, some of the stuff I've seen coming over the uh, online stuff from churches is goofy. He's just playing goofy. This is a serious day. We better wake up. These are not games. The church was never, incidentally, the church was never called to be cool. It was called to be prophetic. There's a big difference. So the nation is coming apart at the seams and we just keep doing our thing. Oblivious to the crisis. Or, or, we will live, uh, I'm just going to read this that I wrote. We will live with a convictional, Christocentric, biblically shaped worldview that refuses to bow to gods of supposed equality and conformity. You will reject the new qualifiers, the terms that are out there right now. All the new qualifiers, you'll reject those if you're a person of the kingdom. You will defy those who want to destroy the fabric of our society. You will not deny societal ills, but neither will you tear the society apart. You will work to reshape and correct as has happened in this nation over all of its history. We will work within the process to right wrongs because wrongs do exist. So, um, there's a lot of giants shouting today. They threaten what will be your end. They're shouting right now, declaring what kind of day you will live in. They are shouting to silence your voice, your faith, your confidence. And they're shouting loud. The giants are shouting and they are demeaning who you are. Your stature, your ability, your color. Lots of giants. Notice what Goliath shouted. Notice the threatening. Verse 8. Why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you are the servants of Saul? Actually, they were the servants of the Most High God. They weren't the servants of Saul. That's why I said to you, Donald Trump is not the Messiah. Neither is He is not David. We are not the servants of the Republican Party or of Donald Trump or of the Democrat Party. We are the servants of the Most High God. First and foremost, the voices that are shouting will try to pigeonhole you and get you to be something less than what you are. Verse 8, choose a man, have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. Verse 42 and 43, he despised him. The giant looked at David, he despised him. And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Verse 44, I'll give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the fields. The giant shouted, but David had a response. See, David knew something very profound. Please, if you, if you don't hear anything else today, would you please hear me say this? David knew something very profound. Profound. The battle was God's to win. 
You are not alone. This is not about your strength. It is about your willing heart to participate, to stand up in the evil day, having done all, stand. So David stands there at the place of the battle and he has a choice. He can listen to Goliath or he can respond to Goliath by declaring who his God was. Oh, I know it's not popular, not cool, and oh, Steve, you know, this day you really can't do that. What would happen if every Christian just started standing up for God in the middle of this hour? This day the Lord will hand you over to me and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. The whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. See, that calls for a people who will stand for truth and who will reject the spirit of anarchy. That calls for a people who will not be silenced in the middle of this day. That calls for people who understand that in the middle of the evil day, there are some people who have to stand. Billy Graham said it this way. He said, when one person of courage stands, it stiffens the spine of others. May God give us some people with godly courage in the middle of this hour who will stand above the fray but speak into the hour of this day. May God deliver us from the fear of man. It will take some courage. And I'll finish with this. Becky wrote a poem in, uh, in uh, 2007 on courage. She said this, courage has many faces and takes on many forms. Courage loves the impossible, and courage hates the norm. Courage is as simple as one standing alone. Courage is as bold as a slingshot and a stone. Courage takes, courage takes on the cause that fear will not embrace. Then courage stands in awe of God's faithfulness and grace. Courage demands a voice. Silence will not do. Courage looks for someone. Will that someone be you? Courage will shape a person, bring hope to a people, faith to a culture, and restore a nation. Fear terrorizes a person, paralyzes a people, breeds hopelessness in a culture, and destroys a nation. And she finished with these words. Courage is not the absence of fear but it is, in fact, the presence of faith. Of all people, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you ought to know in whom you believe. And as the old hymn of the church says, and be persuaded, that he is able to take that which I've committed to him against that day. And if this is the God that can settle my eternity, then right now in my present, this is the God that I could trust in the middle of this kind of hour. To not be pressed to the side, put in the back room, silenced, intimidated. But when fear begins to rise in me, to believe that by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, there is something else that rises. That when that fear begins to rise, there is something rising in me that's greater than my fear. It is my faith in this God who has the power not only to deliver me, but to deliver this nation. How many righteous people will it take? For Sodom and Gomorrah, it was only 10, but they couldn't find 10. 
And so the cry of evil, the Bible says, that reached the heavens was louder than the cry of sin. The, the, the cry of sin was louder than the cry of righteousness. But if there had just been 10, I don't know how many, I don't know how many there, there needs to be for this nation. But I'm going to tell you right now, with every poll that's out, right now with everything that's there, this nation, it looks like we are headed. If we keep going like we're going, we're headed for a very radical change philosophically in terms of what we will be as a people. If you're a believer, if you can lay aside all of your political preferences for a moment, and you can just go look at the facts. Go somewhere, don't buy into all the spend, but take, just take a look at everything that's happened in the last three and a half years that are things that turn this nation, that they're, they're part of, 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 of taking this great ship and, and, and bringing it a turn. Religious freedom, family, faith, values, abortion, those kinds of things. You cannot turn your you cannot turn your head away and not look at the over 60 million babies that have been killed by this nation and somehow think that things will go on as they are unless we turn unless there is a return the judgment of God will rest upon in the harshest judgment in the scripture was spoken over nations who sacrificed their babies their children This may be, God has brought us to this time. And we're all being set up, all the people of God, we're being set up in the middle of this hour just to see if there's a little bit of courage. If somehow we'll wake out of our slumber of just playing around at this church thing and we'll finally decide to be the people of God and in the, in the middle of the evil day we'll stand and lift our voice like a trumpet in the middle of we will not be silenced by the voices that are around us. We will not be intimidated. We will not be shamed. We don't have to be ugly, we don't have to be arrogant, but we do have to be determined. Go ahead and stand with me. What we need today are some Davids. Some people nobody ever heard of before this battle. They're just out there doing their deal. But God's been shaping them out there in the pasture taking care of the sheep and he's given him some winds uh, of a lion and a bear, and he showed them what can happen by his power and strength. Maybe it's time for the people of God to begin to think about this great God, all he's done for you. When he raised you up, when he healed you, when he delivered you, when he provided for you, maybe all of those things. He's been building a testimony in you so that in the middle of this evil hour, you can say, this God that I'm serving, I know. He is, when I was here, he was faithful to me. When I was here, he was faithful to me. I'm over here, he's faithful to me. Now in the middle of this crisis, I can stand in the middle of this hour. And if enough of us will, we may just see the greatest revival this nation has ever seen. And I finish with this. God will go with us into battle, but he will not go for us. He will go with us into battle. He will not go for us. You don't get to sit on your couch at home on this one. You don't get to be an observer on this one. Verse 48 says, It came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hastened and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. God, give us some people who are willing to run to the battle. You can't fight the battle 
on top of that hill, just going out there every day, shouting like you're gonna scare the other side. The other side's not scared of your shout. But if you'll start down that, that hillside into the valley where the, where, the, uh, where the enemy has come standing, who is shouting the taunts, if you'll run down into that valley, as you run down there, the Spirit of the Lord will quicken you. He will, he will equip you. He will enable you. He will empower you. You cannot fight the battle by remaining where you are. The hope of our nation is a renewed, revived, convictional church standing before the Lord, crying out, doing two things. One, crying out for revival. Repenting of our sin. Lord, would you come, blow the breath of your spirit across our land one more time. And then while we're doing that, standing up in the culture, standing against the spirit of anarchy and destruction that wants to rip this country apart. We must not be silent in the middle of this day. I beg you. I beg you to start lifting your voice everywhere you can. I beg you to encourage the people around you to start standing up and speaking out and do not be silent and do not be intimidated by these voices that are out there today. Let's be the people of God. In this nation, we have the great privilege of choosing our destiny and our future. May we choose wisely. May we choose wisely. It may be our last choice. Would you help us, Lord? Would you help us? From our view, these are desperate days. And when we look at our resources, we don't have enough. The forces lined up against everything that is of your way seem overwhelming. But we know one thing, Lord. It is not by might nor by power. It is by your spirit, says the Lord. And so we stand in the middle of this time. May this house and every church house like this miraculously somehow would you begin to stir and may it be a house of prayer that you've ordained so that in the middle of this hour the community begins together, the faith community begins together. So there is a cry out to you for you to come again. And Lord, would you grant to us all boldness that we may speak your word and in the middle of this evil day, would you speak through us? Would you help us to lay aside any desire to be popular? Would you make us prophetic? And would you cause the voice of your church to resound in the middle of this time, I pray. Help us, oh God. I speak this prayer in your strong name that's above every other name, who is our deliverer, our savior, our redeemer. In the name of Jesus. And would you today affirm that with just the speaking of the amen.